Brought to you by BedroomBattlefields.com, this is the Tabletop Miniature Hobby Podcast. On the Tabletop Miniature Hobby Podcast for the third time and completing his hat trick is Frostgrave, Stargrave and Rangers of Shadow Deep creator Joe McCulloch. Since I started this podcast, Rangers of Shadow Deep is probably the game that's had the most coverage and it's certainly the one that I get the most feedback about, be that from folks who already love it or from people who like the sound of it and are gearing up to play it for the very first time. I want to ask Joe a few of the recurring questions that I've put to other games designers on the show and I had some listener questions submitted through our Discord community too. But I want to kick things off by getting up to speed on what he's published since we last spoke in early 2022, starting with a Frostgrave expansion called Fireheart. Yeah, so <laughs> it seems a long time ago to me because, of course, it's, you know, a year or more that I write something before it comes out. But um, Fireheart was kind of my chance to to do two things. One, I wanted to look at constructs because kind of there's, there's always been three things that, that wizards can kind of bring onto the table in Frostgrave, undead demons and constructs. And, and I'd done books that really focused on undead and, and focused on demons. And I'd never done anything with, with constructs, which is a shame because there's so much you can do with them. I mean, they're, since they're essentially magical robots, any, anything you can think of for a robot, could be on a construct and and I love that you can think of them uh either that way or you can think of them as you know animated brooms in from Disney movies um there's just a lot of wiggle room for people to bring in the miniatures they really want to bring in to their war band and to justify having any miniature in there so you know if you want a, a chest of drawers that walks around you can have that or you can have a big wooden monstrosity with a, a saw blade and you know a, a flamethrower arm and so this book gives a lot of rules for uh making those kind of things and, and making them happen and giving them special rules and just making constructs more interesting uh in the game um at the same time i wanted to write a book that helped people make their own scenarios by giving them a lot of weird things that you could just kind of dump onto the table, um, kind of centerpieces of a scenario, uh, be that a giant uh, fan that rotates around and sucks people in and blows them out or, you know, lava rivers flowing across the table. So just rules for w- some of the weird and wonderful things you could find in the frozen city, but not necessarily presented in a scenario um, so that you could either construct your own scenarios or roll randomly. Um, so that's, that's mainly what, what Fireheart is a bunch of uh, magical robots and weird and wonderful things that you might find while wandering around the frozen city. The next one to ask you about is, is grave mutations. But before I do that, yep. when you put together one of these supplements, then what uh, has there been a typical thought process between like you come up with this idea of it'd be cool to have this and, and then actually thinking, okay, I am going to work on this. Like how, how does yep. that typically pan out? If at all? Um, normally I begin with, well, I guess there's two things. I, sometimes I, I pick a theme like that. Like I really want to look at constructs. Um, other times, and, and even if I've already picked the theme, I'll, I'll do this as well. But I, I try to ask myself, what makes this supplement different than all the ones that have gone before? What What am I bringing that's new to the game? And I don't want to just bring kind of new rules in the sense that now we have constructs and here's all the, the bits they can have. Obviously, I wanted to do that and bring that to the game. But what new aspect kind of am I giving to the players? And and, and in this case, that was that kind of here's, here's the stuff to construct your own scenarios uh, kind of thing. So I'm always wanting to combine that idea of, sure, here's more material, here's more monsters, here's more treasure. But also with a here's either a different way to play or a different way to look at the game or 
new tools that I've never really given you before for, for building the game in the way you want it to be. What about grave mutations then? Is the clue very much in the name of this one? I think grave mutations is uh, the ultimate expression of me having fun. Um, so it kind of it goes back to one of my all time favorite gaming books, which is the original Realms of Chaos book for Warhammer. And and when I say for Warhammer in those days, it was for both Warhammer Fantasy and Warhammer Forty Thousand. And it's <laughs> it's hard to say what the book is about exactly, other than it's about the realms of chaos. It um, but what I really love about it is it, it basically allows you to to build your own chaos warband. But unlike modern gaming, where you would generally construct that out of points. In this system, it's completely random. You you roll for your leader randomly. You roll for what equipment he has randomly. You roll for what mutations he has randomly. And then you roll for his warband randomly. Um, it's a random number of a random units. And it, it's just everything about the book is utterly random. Um, and that is exemplified in the book by its D1000 mutation table. Um, now, it doesn't actually have 1,000 mutations, but you do roll a D1,000. Um, and I just absolutely loved and love still rolling on that table because it's just absolutely hilarious. Um, you just you just end up with some of the wildest and craziest things. And I'd been thinking about that for a while, and I was thought, can I do that for Frostgrave? Um, and then it became this challenge to write a D1000 mutation table that actually had a thousand different entries. And that is Grave Mutations. Um, Grave Mutations, the book, is literally one table with a thousand entries um, of just random mutations that your Frostgrave characters can get. And it doesn't give you any specific reasons to roll on that table, though it offers a few suggestions. Um, and it doesn't kind of give any rules for <laughs> what to do with those mutate. Well, I mean, it has rules for each individual mutation, but it doesn't say like you should use them this way in the game or you should work them into a campaign like this. It's just one giant table for the players to have fun with and, and to use in any way they want. Um, and it was so out there that um, I showed it to Osprey knowing that they wouldn't publish it and, and wouldn't want to publish it and absolutely shouldn't publish it. But I said, I really love this and I want to make it available to people. Do you mind if I self-publish it? And they said, that's fine. Um, and so I put it out um, and you can get it on drive through RPG. And yeah, that's what it is. One big silly table um, that, that fills me with delight. <laughs> this is a, a, an ignorant question from me and one that I could easily have just Googled the past few years to find an answer for, but how do you roll a D1000? I bet most of the listeners <laughs> I, I do, know this. I do actually say that in the book because I, as I was talking to a few people about it, they asked me that and I was like, oh yeah, I guess that isn't obvious. But but essentially you get three 10-sided dies, you know, in the same way you roll a percentile with two 10-sided die, you roll D1000 with three. So you have a hundreds die, a tens die, and a... a um, ones uh, tens no what do you call that you know the the lowest one <laughs> and um and if you get three zeros that's one thousand so so yeah you pick up your three ten siders and roll and uh who knows where you'll end up and one of the things i loved about the original and, and i worked into mine is you know those mutations can be really good or they can be really bad or they can be anywhere in between including mostly pointless um but just fun. Uh, so it's a great excuse to, to model figures if you want to do that, you know, to cut up plastic and, and make your war band um, or just to just to roll and have fun. Next up on my things to catch up with you about uh, old bones. Talk to us about old bones. OK. Um, so for a few years, I'd put out a little magazine called Spellcaster, which was basically just a collection of things I had written for Frostgrave or Ghost Archipelago that 
didn't have a home anywhere else because generally they were too short or too disconnected from anything that I'd written or were outside the official game world. So like issue one has rules for firearms and for black powder weapons, but of course there's no black powder weapons officially in Frostgrave, but I know some people wanted them. So I wrote them and I stuck it in there. Um, and I, and I did seven issues of Spellcaster. Uh, and then I started to encounter a couple of problems. Uh, the first was that, well, I should say, so all of Spellcaster was always set up as a co-op between me the illustrator and the designer. And, um, you know, we put it together together and then we, we shared the profits. Um, the first problem became that the cover artist, Dmitry Burmak, who'd done all the first edition Frostgrave, is, is Russian. And when the war broke out, uh, there was essentially no way to pay him. He couldn't, he couldn't get his royalties, um, which... I understand from a political standpoint, but, but was a little rough. Um, and so I thought, I don't really want to do new issues without him because he's been such an integral part of this. Um, it, it didn't seem right. Um, at the same time, um, I'd, I'd been having a bit of trouble with the structure of Spellcraster because it, every issue had been a little bit bigger than the last one. And it just kind of kept growing and growing. And it, it started to become too much work. Um, you know, if you end up with a magazine that's the same length as a supplement, you know, I'm essentially doing the same work um, for something that I don't want to be at the same level. Um, but I didn't, I also thought it doesn't seem right to then increase the length continuously and then just knock it way back down. That, that'll look weird. Um, and finally, I realized I don't want to be just writing this kind of thing for Frostgrave. I've now got a bunch of different games. And of course that, that wasn't true when I started on Spellcaster, but by the time I, by the time we've reached now, I've got about five different games that, that I work on. And I thought I'd love to be able to, to do Spellcaster type stuff for, for all those games. Um, and so I decided, all right, maybe it's time to put Spellcaster on the shelf since I can't do it the way I want it to anyway, and, and try something a little new. And, and that was Old Bones, which with Old Bones, I set myself some specific rules and one of those was a, a strict word count. Um, it's never going to be bigger than this or, or, you know, I'm going to keep it right in the vicinity of this each time. So each one will be about the same length and I'm going to allow myself to write for any of my games or, or pull pieces for, for any of my games. Um, and I've got my friend Barrett, who's done all the art on Rangers of Shadow Deep to come on as, as, the artist for it, both the covers and, and internal stuff. Um, and we created this new little co-op and, and that's old bones. So it, it's just a new way for me to present little bits and pieces for my game that don't have homes anywhere else, but also to just kind of put out the, the kind of little magazine that I would want to get if, if I was a fan, well, I am a fan of these games, but, <laughs> um, you know, if, if I were the, the customer for these kind of games, that is that little bit of extra something that you get every so often just to kind of keep your enthusiasm up and to generate new ideas for the game. Is that available in print form as well as PDF? Uh, yeah, so it's uh, print on demand. So if you go to Drive Through RPG, you can get it there. Yeah, it's either PDF or print on demand. And and the print on demand, I've got to say, is, is pretty good quality, um, especially for a little magazine. So not only did I not know how a D1000 works, I've also never said the word te tenebrous, te tenebrous. <laughs> I, I don't know what it yeah. means. I've never said it before. I, I don't think most people have, to be fair. Uh, it's tenebrous. And tenebrous. It's kind of a outdated word that, you know, you'd probably find in H.P. Lovecraft and, and not many other places. Uh, it essentially means dark and gloomy. Um, so if you're, Probably people come across it in their thesaurus. That's that's probably the only place people find it now. But but I, I came across it in my thesaurus, I don't know, a couple of decades ago. And and since then, it's always been one of my fun go-to words because it because um, everything I write is dark and gloomy, right? And and it's kind of fun to use a word that people don't expect. Um, so it's it's a bit of an eye catcher. <laughs>
So what can we expect from is is this uh, one scenario? Is it multiple scenarios, like a mini campaign or Yeah, so Tenebris Citadel is actually part three of um a series I wrote for Rangers of Shadow Deep. Uh, one one big mission called the Rescue that you could play in, in three very distinct pieces. So it started with Across the Wastes, then continued in Dungeons Deep or Dungeons Dark. And now ends with Tenebris Citadel. And Tenebris Citadel, let me, I've actually got to pull it off my shelf here. So I can't remember how many scenarios it actually has. <laughs> but, uh, yeah. So it's actually got 10, 10 scenarios divided into a couple of parts. Um, and I wanted it to be a really big conclusion, both to this three-part rescue, this trilogy of adventures I'd written, but also a point for me to kind of step back from Rangers of Shadow Deep and say, here you go. Like, I'm not saying the war is won, but you've, if you've completed this, you, you have won a big victory. Um, so it's, it's a point where you can really celebrate. And that, that's something that the game doesn't have a lot because it is quite a dark, grim kind of game. But, um, yeah, I wanted to give chance for people to say, all right, you know, in some ways, these rangers that I've played with have won. They've, they've accomplished this quest that nobody thought would be possible and, and really done something. Obviously, I don't want to say too much about it because I don't want to give, give stuff away. But um, so you, you can play it by itself if you want. Um, it's got all the stuff to bring you up to speed if you, if you haven't played the previous two. But if you're into it, you probably want to play the other two first because there are parts that connect between between all three and and it's just more fun because you get more more scenarios <laughs> is there any one of your games that is much harder or more time consuming to play test than others i mean from again i'm not a game designer but i imagine it would be rangers of shadow deep but am i am i right on it's, that or um i guess there's 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 two things that make playtesting harder for me. Um, obviously, anytime you do a new system, you're going to need more playtesting than you are when you're you're just adding stuff onto a system. Um, and and some of those systems are a lot more complex than others. Uh, you know, Oathmark being a, a mass battle game proved to be much much more complex than than Frostgrave or, or even Rangers of Shadowdeep. Um, but it's also true that anything that involves solo play I find needs more playtesting because essentially when you're f- playing competitively if if you're setting up situations where both players have equal access to the good stuff and the bad stuff you know you've got balance in, in a scenario whereas in a solo game you're trying to balance you're really trying to balance the rules of the scenario versus the expectations of the player. And of course, as a game designer, you're only so aware of the expectations of the player. But, you know, I have to balance it and say, I want this scenario to be about this hard, you know. And and with Rangers of Shadow Deep, that's not consistent. Some are meant to be easier than others. And, you know... I might say to myself, I'd really like this scenario on average to cost the player, you know, three of his guys, they get knocked out and we'll have to roll on the survival table. Or I might say, this is, this is the big one. You know, this is the climax. I want the player to only have a 50, 50 chance of actually winning this scenario, you know, and that's, that's really hard to do, especially when I am using quite famously, you know, the D20, which, which does offer a lot more random possibility. Um, so when I say that's what I want to happen, what I'm saying is what I, I'm hoping that'll happen, you know, uh, say 30% of the time. And then the other 70% will be dis- divided between it goes slightly better than that. And it goes slightly worse than that, but it's, it's quite delicate and, and does, require a lot of little fiddling and, and stuff. So 
but it, it's fun. Yeah. I've got some. I've got a handful of sort of recurring questions for the podcast that I would like to ask if you'll indulge yeah. me. I say a handful. There's six. I suppose that's okay. a slightly mutated <laughs> that's, handful, isn't it? An extra finger in hand. You've been rolling on the uh, great mutation table. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. <laughs> Um, the first one was: uh, Do you do you have like a best value budget hobby purchase of something less than like twenty quid? Um, all right. Uh, I'll I'll give you two answers because because one of them seems slightly self serving. Um, so the, the the first one, the slightly self serving one. If I was to start off kind of right now, war gaming, and and I wanted to do science fiction, I should say. I would get a box of Stargrave Scavengers. And the reason is it's it's 20 quid, you get 20 figures, and the possibility of those figures is just immense. So they're called scavengers. What you've got is guys in kind of cloaks and jackets, and you can build them to be, you know, kind of desert raiders or gang members, thugs. Um, but I've also painted them up as Jedi in their kind of robes and, you know, you give them the right heads and they can look like kind of men in black. Um, and there's, there's even parts for zombies on the, the kit. So there's some zombie heads and zombie arms. So not only can you do your, your team, but you can do some zombies for them to fight. And I just love that modularity of the kit and how much you can get out of it. Um, for you know for a low price you know you're getting the good guys and the bad guys and and just lots of possibilities so i definitely suggest that one um you know and and there are other kits like that like the the frostgrave cultists works in slightly the same way but that one just really think seems to hit the sweet spot for me um, are they north star they they are north star so yeah and they they came out about i don't know four or five months ago, I think. I can't I can't really remember. But yeah, I've been I've been having a lot of fun mixing in fact I'm even right now I've I'm doing what is essentially Gene Steeler cultists um for my Space Hulk using that box kit because they got it's got some heads that that work really well for kind of Gene Steeler cultists and then I've got a few old Gene Steelers so I'm I'm clipping kind of the claw arms off them and, and gluing one on to each one and, you know, giving them a pistol or something in the other hand. And so, again, it really just a lot of possibility for that. Um, so, yeah. Uh, if I was going to go outside of <laughs> stuff that's related to my work and, and go with kind of probably the best thing I've ever bought cheaply for, for wargaming, and that's a, that's a set of Jenga blocks. And that that sounds weird. They're not even Jenga blocks. They're knockoff Jenga blocks, so they're even cheaper. Um, but you can just do so much with this box of blocks. You can basically create any terrain layout you need. Um, you know, if you need buildings, you can just do the outline of a building, or you, or you could literally build the building. Um, you can make walls out of it. You can make corridors. You can just do everything. And if you spray paint them black or gray, they look great. You know, they, they look like corridors or dungeon, uh, cor you know, dungeon corridors or spaceship corridors. It, it, they can work for either. Um, if you're playing Frostgrave or whatever, you could literally just take the box and upend it on the table and there's your mountain of rubble and you can play over it. Um, so... Honestly, it, it doesn't even sound like a wargaming thing, but it is fantastic. It's it's always there when you just need a bit more terrain on your table or you need something specific. You can just quickly build it. Um, and if, if you have a kid who's grown out of it, just steal their blocks as well and spray paint them gray because <laughs> that's an, that, that'll work just as well if you need some bigger structures. So. Yeah, based on your advice around that, I got myself a set, and we played um, Blood Moon. We we outlined the manor house because you had yeah. rooms, and we also did. I'm sure it was the bridge guards where you'd really you're trying not to be seen. Yeah. So we used the blocks to basically, you know, it could have been rubble or trees or whatever, but it, it worked really well. Like it's amazing how once you start rolling dice, the 
exactly you know, the, your the brain cartoony just, nature of it vanishes so yep it just your your brain fills in the gaps and colors things for you and and you you know i i love a great table filled with beautiful terrain as much as the next guy but you can't always achieve that and and the truth is you don't always have to you know next question and when was the last time something in the hobby surprised you okay um yeah, that, that one's actually not that hard for me. Um, so I'm going to, I'm going to say the, the army painter speed paints. So when contrasts and speed paints and this whole kind of, of new wave of painting, uh, paints came out, I was a little bit eh about them. Um, uh, you know, I really enjoy the act of painting and, and painting fast has never been something I'm that interested in. Uh, so I kind of ignored, ignored them uh, for, for quite a while. And um, a few months ago, I, I pulled out a box of War Games Atlantic Lizardmen. I think they're called Lizardmen anyway. And I was looking at them and I thought, I do want to paint these, but I'd painted a few of them and they were just a pain to, to paint because they've, they've got all these great scales and I wanted to paint them blue and it just took forever to kind of dry brush over all their skin because they're, they're, you know, they're basically wearing loincloths and, and they're otherwise scales. Um, so I thought, all right, I'll give it a shot. I bought one army painter blue and uh, painted that on there and they looked fantastic. I, I, I was just really shocked by how great it worked. Essentially it, it, in fact, it, it looked better after one coat of the speed paints uh, than my original ones where I'd used washes and layers and, and dry brushing to, to get, to try to get the same effect. <laughs> so I was like, okay, um, my, my eyes are a bit opened. And, and since then I've bought a couple other speed paints again, not to save time, but to accomplish things that I, was never great at accomplishing. So I bought one that I thought I was going to use for like skeletons and I think it's called pallid, pallid bone or something like that. Um, and I, I, it's as, as it turned out, I didn't really like it for skeletons, but I found out it works for me anyway, fantastic for horns. I've always had a real issue painting horns on, on monsters, you know, on beast men or, anything with horns um i could just never kind of get the effect i want but i tried that out and and again one coat of that achieved a better look than than i'd ever been able to do so i i am now a believer in that this is just a great new new and additional tool that that you can add to your your paint box not necessarily to paint really fast but to achieve effects that either you're unable to achieve or that, you know, you, you've had trouble achieving in the past. So, so yeah, that was a good discovery for me and, and a surprising one. I'm unsure if this will maybe then tie into this next question. Maybe not. Maybe it's a completely different direction, but uh, tell me something that you once believed about the hobby that turned out not to be true. <laughs> it, it does kind of. Um, so I'd say the the big thing is, that more is better. Um, you know, and that's in truth, that's not just related to our hobby. That's, that's related to all of our consumerist society. But, you know, when you're a kid and you, you've got these limited resources um, and, and that limited resource that translates into the limited resources to game with, you, you just dream about oh, all the stuff you want and how great it would be if you had it. And then you become an adult and you have the disposable income to, to get a lot of these things. And it can be fun. It, don't, don't get me wrong. But it's not as much fun as you thought it was going to be. <laughs> and, and in truth, you never re fully recapture, I think, that that just kind of burning joy of any hobby uh, that you did when you were, say, 12 
Um, and I think a lot of our industry recently, especially is geared towards is geared towards that idea. Hey, you can recapture the love of being 12 if you just buy X and then Y and, and keep buying and keep buying. And it doesn't work, you know, (laughs) it, um, you know, don't, don't get me wrong. I, I buy stuff and I continue to buy stuff all the time. Um, partly because I, I just love painting and thus I always need something to paint. But in terms of kind of my gaming, I'm now much more a believer of find the few systems or settings that you really love and go deep on those, but do it slowly. Um, so that you're not just always, you know, on this treadmill of I've got to, I've got to do a new army. I've got to do a new army. I've got to do a new army. I mean, how many armies can you truly play with, you know, in a given year? And, and is, is it really better to have all these things when you could be using some of that time to focus deeper on the things you already have, go deeper on the army you've already have by, constructing scenarios for it or or working on its background or really concentrating on adding a few figures that give the army a new aspect or give it more character or more narrative um so yeah i've i've really come to the kind of for me it, it is literally i every so often i make a list like these are the games i want to play and there's really no point in buying stuff outside of these games because I won't use them. So if I, if I have that moment of, I really want the new shiny, but it doesn't fit with anything I actually do, you know, either go back to that list and cross off something there and add this on, or just let it go. You know, there's, there's never going to, we're never going to run out of new and shiny. So (laughs) there'll be, there'll be a next new shiny. You can wait for that one. Is there anything in the hobby that's true that almost nobody agrees with you about? <laughs> um, I don't know if there's there's anything that almost nobody agrees with me about. There's certainly things that I guess I stand on one side of an argument and, and a lot of the hobby stands on the other. And I guess the most obvious of that is for me that randomization is a great thing. <laughs> and I mean, at some level, we all agree randomization is great because we play with dice. And, and if we didn't play with dice, we wouldn't be wargaming. We'd be doing something else. But I obviously love it to a level that, that a lot of people don't and to a lot a level that a lot of people loathe. So a lot of people cannot get past rolling a D20 in a war game, um, even though in some ways, say Frostgrave, its combat system is not as random as people think, but, but regardless, you know, I am the guy who just wrote, wrote a D 1000 mutation table. Obviously I, I have a, a true joy of randomness, but for some people, randomness is an incredibly frustrating thing in a game. And maybe that's really a division between kind of those who are playing a game more as a tactical exercise and those who are playing it more as a narrative, um, joy but yeah for me i i I fully believe in embrace randomization and and find the joy in it and find the ways it can make the experience better but a lot of people don't don't agree with me on that our question of the month for february 2024 is warhammer the old world will you be playing it if so why and if not why not I'd love to hear your thoughts and opinions on this one. Head on over to bedroombattlefields.com slash voicemail to record your audio feedback and we'll look to play it on a future episode. And feel free to give a wee shout out too to your own podcast, YouTube channel, Instagram account or any other hobby content that you create. That link again is bedroombattlefields.com slash voicemail. And now back to the episode. 
Could you tell us about any particularly satisfying mechanic that you've either created yourself or you've come across whilst playing somebody else's game, or both? Um, well, a, a few years ago, I actually wrote an article for War Games Illustrated on my top 10 wargaming mechanics. Um, and I, I can't remember what all 10 are off the top of my head, but <laughs> obviously mechanics is something I think about all the time. You know, it's, it's literally part of my job. And even if it wasn't part of my job, I don't think I could stop myself from doing it. Um, so gosh, I mean, like, there's so many as far as I'm concerned, because, you know, for me, every aspect of a game can have unique and elegant mechanics. So like movement in, in most games, movement is a very set kind of thing. You can move your guy six inches, you know, if you, if you are doing unit, you can move it and you can make one maneuver with it. You know, there's nothing, that's absolutely fine, but there's nothing amazing or elegant about it. About it, and then you see something like X Wing, the the miniatures game, that just has this incredible movement mechanic where you know you have the secret little spinner where you decide what move your your ship's going to make, and everyone does that for all their ships, and then you reveal it, and they all just go everywhere in a way that just fantastically recaptures the look and feel of the movies. Um, you know, and that's that's just movement. Um, like my, my all time favorite game mechanic. And it's one I've talked about before, um, is the combat mechanic in a game called silent death, where it's about space fighters shooting it out. And every gun system in the game rolls three dice. And two of those dice are determined by what that gun system is. And one of those dice is determined by the gunner like the gunner's skill. So, you know, you might have a 2d6 gun skill, but a gunner with a d8. So you roll 2d6 and and d8. And what's really beautiful about it is you roll those three dice and add them together to see if you hit. But then you look at the dice a different way based on, well, to determine how much damage is done. So a gun might have a damage level of medium. So you'd roll the three dice and you'd find the medium die and and that would be the damage done. And that idea of one die roll serving multiple functions has been hugely um, influential to me. Uh, you know, obviously you see it in, in basically all my games. So Frostgrave has that same idea of make one die roll, determines who wins and how much damage is done. And Silver Bayonet has that as well. Um, so yeah, that's, that's a biggie, but there's there's just so many. Um, like recently, Marvel Crisis Protocol, I love the way power works in that. I love how as things happen through the game and as a figure gets hit, it can actually gain power. And thus by having something bad happen to it, it is also given the potential to do more things. And, and that's just a beautifully elegant balancing mechanism within the game but also again really captures the flavor of what they were trying to mimic in that game of superheroes you know beating each other up um and and in all, all honesty i could just go on and on because <laughs> these these things are like they're like little bits of art to me so i, I do collect them where did you say that article was published that you wrote your top 10 uh war games illustrated I, I couldn't cool. tell you what issue, to be honest. Well, I probably could, but not without digging through some things. So, <laughs> yeah, I'd imagine their back episodes will be available for sale yeah, somewhere. They are. Yeah. Um, final question on my six finger mutated uh, list of recurring questions: uh, right. Any common hobby myths and misconceptions that make you roll your eyes? <laughs> roll my eyes. Um... Generally, I'm a kind of live and let live guy, so I, I don't. I try not to get involved in things too much and, and worry too much about what other people are doing. I guess one that does annoy me, though, is 
the kind of the idea that games are written or created by companies um, and not people, you know, <laughs> and and that's something that some companies have have tried to promote by not telling you who actually created them. And and I get there is an element of it was created by a team or it was cre- created by a committee, you know, and thus it is hard to maybe assign exactly who did what. But in some ways you don't have to. And and in truth, if there is a game created, everybody knows who did the core elements of it and who helped out and added to it. And I just, I always believe that people should be credited for their work. Um, even if that work is done, you know, under the auspices of a company, you know, and yeah, so that, that one just annoys me because, because it, it, it's filtered out into the industry that, Hey, this, this is a game by Osprey and, and Osprey is really good about crediting their creators. You know, my name is on the cover of, of all my works and, and, so is everybody who's, who's done a book for Osprey. But, you know, so it does annoy me when people say, hey, this book was done by Osprey. And all right, literally the book was compiled by Osprey. But what they really mean is, you know, what they should be saying is here is a game created by someone published by Osprey. And yeah, I guess that just riles me up occasionally. Not not a lot, not usually, but I just I want people to get the credit they deserve and and not even me. I, I get, I'm not, I am lucky compared to probably most people in this industry. My name is well known because Osprey has put it on the book because Osprey has always encouraged it to be aware, you know, people to be aware of me as a creator. Um, but not everybody's been able to work under that kind of, well, under, under, a company that's quite so forward thinking like that and, and credit to Osprey. They've just started um, to put the illustrators on the covers as well. Um, so now all of the frost grant books going forward are going to have illustrated by rumor down at the bottom. As she's done all the work, um, all the illustrations for second edition of the game. And, and that's, you know, that's wonderful. And I'm not saying companies need to put all the stuff on the cover, but I want to be able to open a gaming book and see who designed the game or who was the lead designer on the game um, because that's important to me. It's important to to know who did that and to be able to follow their work or, or look at other things they've done or, or just be aware of them in case I, you know, come across them at a gaming convention and say, hey, good job on that. So, so yeah, that's, that's, that's my rant. <laughs> Got uh, uh, three questions to finish us off from from listeners. That's my entire listenership, to be honest. That must have got okay. in touch. Uh, <laughs> no, so we've, got, we've got a question from Mark here. Hi, Joe. This is Mark. My question for you is, I know your first game you ever had published was a Middle-earth role-playing game supplement. Would you ever consider writing a game in a licensed property, or do you prefer to make games in your own settings? Um... If I was given the chance to to write for Middle Earth again, I probably would, because that that war, world and work has such a huge place in my heart. Beyond that, though, probably not. I've I've talked to people about it occasionally, um, and every time I do, I just kind of feel like I'm just not hugely passionate about this because I want the freedom to do whatever I want when I write games and when I create worlds. Um, that's, that's just not a constraint I generally want to deal with. Um, and it's, it, it's just more fun creating my own stuff. And, and as a bonus to that, I end up owning that creation where I, I couldn't, if it was, you know, writing for Marvel superheroes or, you know, Star Wars or something, um, you know, that said, I, I am a freelancer who has to make a living doing this. So if someone came by with a, a big enough check, I might break, but 
<laughs> but no, generally I prefer to, to, to work on my own stuff. Uh, Jason sent a question and he was talking about um, how when he looks back at, I mean, he, he says he, he qualifies this with the fact that he's 36, but he says looking back at games between maybe the 70s and the 90s, miniature games, the role of the, the DM or GM was pretty typical. Yeah. Uh, and now he feels that, you know, it's very uncommon. And he he was sort of wondering your opinion on this. Like, has he's saying here, has the GM role moved onto the rule books? Uh, you know, Frostgrave scenarios, etc. Mm-hmm. Uh, and he's asking, why don't we play more GM games like that now? Uh, and if you've any sort of strong opinions or thoughts on it, I do. Uh, <laughs> I mean, we don't we don't play that way as much now because it's not encouraged. Um, and and why it's not encouraged? Well, it's not encouraged because the bigger companies have realized that you can sell more miniatures by creating a competitive format where two people can show up at a gaming store with no uh, forward thought, with no forward planning, and throw down on the table and play. And and there is a definite need and utility for that. Um, And from a company point of view, again, it sells more miniatures. But I actually, personally, I, I do believe it's a slightly... Well, no, I don't want to say it's inferior, but I think there is more ultimate joy to be found in in doing a game mastered approach. And I have so I mean, one of the reasons I wrote Rangers of Shadow Deep was to try to write a miniatures game that felt like it had a games master, but doesn't, um, because obviously I can't be their game mastering for you, but. But it is something that I've I've been thinking about a lot. I love I've always worked around that line where war games are drifting towards role playing games, and I want to dabble. No, I don't want to dabble. I want to really work on that even more. And so I have been actually thinking about this a lot and bringing back not at least giving players the encouragement to bring back the game master. Um, Because there are just things you can do with the game masters. You can't do any other way. You know, there's hidden information and there are other ways to do that, but the game master is still the best way to do that. More importantly, the game master is a thinking brain that can modify a game on the fly and thus push it gently in the direction of the enjoyment of the players, uh, which no set of rules can do. You know, it, it, no, no set of rules can read the emotions of a table or a room, which a game master can, and, and thus, you know, push it more towards fun. So it's something, yeah, I have thought about a lot and something I want to start working more into my works not i don't necessarily want to make a game where you have to have a game master because not everyone can achieve that but i do want to talk about it as an option and and talk a bit more about the benefits of that so yeah i'd I'd like to see it return i mean it's never completely disappeared you know i i still play games of that style. I know a lot of people say of probably my generation do, but I think it is less common amongst the younger generations um, because just because I think they haven't been exposed to it. Final questions from Rob. Uh, Apologies to Rob because I'm going to attempt to paraphrase it and I'll probably butcher it, but uh, (laughs) Rob's played multiple games of Frostgrave, Stargrave and Ghost Archipelago. Um, and he, he felt when he was playing Frostgrave, it was quite light on the combat and his experience because he was more focused on the, the treasure and magic mm-hmm. and things like that. And he found the Stargrave games that he played, you know, they were a lot more bloody, a lot more pinned down firefights and stuff. And it seems that he found Ghost Archipelago as like a good balance or sweet spot between the two. So he's curious to hear your, your comments on your design goals and tweaking this balance, you know, if they're yeah. not- if you were aware of that, to, to be to be honest, I suppose. Um, 
I mean, I guess the the thing about Frostgrave is it um, Frostgrave can be played both ways quite easily, and it, it depends just really upon the players. It, it's certainly an easier game to be less violent, um, and really the the what this mostly comes down to is the way that treasure works. Um, in Frostgrave, treasure is easier to pick up and run off with, both because the rules for treasure are are easier to pick up and run off with, but also because there are less ranged weapons on the table so that once you start getting away, it's much harder for anyone to, to stop you. In Stargrave, uh, it's it's actually harder to pick up treasure um, or loot in, the, in that case because there are specific rules for how you do that and guys that are better at accomplishing it than others. So if you get the wrong guys there, it can become very difficult to pick up the treasure. Additionally, once that treasure is picked up or, or while you're trying to pick it up, people are shooting at you. And, and in that game, everyone can shoot at you because everyone's got a gun. Um, and I did, I guess I did intentionally want Stargrave to be more violent in, in the sense that, you know, I wanted the games to be big old firefights. <laughs> and, um, and so I wanted, I wanted to make players potentially get, pen down because I just I love that um boy I'm gonna go back here but I don't I don't know how big on role playing you are but so uh, there's a cover of maybe it's the first I think it's the first edition of Shadowrun but one of the editions of Shadowrun and it's a cyberpunk game and there's a lovely scene where one guy is basically jacked into a computer so he's got a, a thing running from his head into the computer and he's obviously like downloading all the important data and then you've got his two mates you know one of whom's like casting a spell and the other one who's opening up with some some Uzis or something covering this kind of corridor or alleyway and you can see the kind of the bad guys in the distance um and i just i love that picture because of the story it's telling of like this desperate you know, come on, come on, come on, download, download, download while everybody else is shooting it out and wondering how long is this going to take? And, and that's, I wanted to bring that to Stargrave, that kind of desperation of, God, we got to do this and we got to do this fast. But in some ways it takes as long as it takes. So we're going to have to sit here and get shot at until, until we get that done. And I mean, like I said, so I don't think either of those is right or wrong. It, it just comes down to your play style. Um, if you like, you know, a little, a little less combatty y um, than, than you might prefer Stargrave. I mean, for Frostgrave over Stargrave, but if you want more, more shooting then then obviously Stargrave's your one. Um, Ghost Archipelago. And, and I do take his point because I do think it, it has a nice mix of that um, because in, Ghost Archipelago, you can get loot and get it off the table in the same fashion as Frostgrave, so it's it's easier. But because you don't have wizards, you've got these kind of these heritors, these kind of superhumans. They have to literally go into the thick of it to to get that in a way that wizards often don't, because they can float treasure out and stuff like that, or float people out. Um, so it's a little more physical uh, in there, and but it's not so bad as everybody having a gun and shooting at you. So. I, it just comes down to what you like. Um, I don't think any of those is superior. The The key was, the, for me, trying to match that idea with the setting I was trying to create. So both Frostgrave and Ghost Archipelago are supposed to be quite pulpy fun, you know, in, in the kind of old old movie sense where, you know, there's lots of adventure and a few people get killed or, you know, fall off the boat or whatever, but it's not too bad. Whereas Stargrave is supposed to feel much more gritty and, and dangerous. And hopefully I accomplish that. But, you know, again, it's it's what people like. There is one more question which takes us nicely to the end of the episode. Okay. So, Tim, 
Tim was asking, uh, could you ask Joe if there are any plans to slow down on his prolific output, <laughs> maybe take a year out, a year or two out to give my wallet a little rest? So that, that leads in nicely to, to find out what's coming down the pipeline next. Anything you could talk about? Yeah. Uh, yeah. I mean, I, I would say like, in some ways, I mean, no, I can't stop for, for a couple of reasons. One, because it's my job and I got to do it, but... <laughs> But also just like, I just love it. And, and I'm not, you know, m- the vast majority of the time, if I'm creating stuff, I am creating it for me because I want to and because it's interesting to me and, and I, I just got to get it out. Um, and thankfully, there's people that, that want to publish that or, or I'd publish it myself. But, um, and also I've found that I am very much a person who, loves to work intensely on something for a while and then not as intensely on things for a while. So I tend to have periods where I am really into my creativity, into my game design, and and that's both physical banging on the computer or, or playtesting or just continuously crunching mechanics in my head. And, and then there's other periods where I'm not actually doing that much, at least in a, in a conscious way. I think there is still a lot of subconscious going on. And um, now it's not like I'm not trying to be prolific <laughs> in all honesty. It's just how it happens. And it's just that it's I'm in this rare position of being a full-time war games writer, which is rare. It, it may even even actually be unique. I don't know if anyone's just doing that. Um, so, so I can't slow down. But but also, when you're a, a freelancer, you're you're constantly living in fear of not being able to eat or or pay your mortgage or you know pay for your kids' school clothes. <laughs> so. <laughs> So some there are times where it's like oh I can't slow down gotta keep going gotta keep pushing but um, so so I am I'm I'm still doing things um, so what's 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 coming out uh, I should I should know but I can't always remember uh, so Frostgrave's got a new supplement coming this year uh, called Mortal Enemies which is a good example of just like this idea that I started playing with and just spiraled out of control and became a supplement, which was the idea of basically reoccurring bad guys in, in Frostgrave. So one of the main things people seem to love about Frostgrave is random monsters, which I guess wasn't a very common thing in, in wargaming before that. Um, and so much so, in fact, that I made them even more common in second edition because people complained that they didn't happen enough in, in first edition. And so now I kind of wanted to take that to the next level and say, you know, not only do you have wandering monsters, but some wizards acquire mortal enemies who are basically monsters or could be other wizards that, that reoccur throughout a campaign and, you know, Hate, hate your wizard specifically for some reason and are always looking for a way to, to get him. And um, because, you know, as I was thinking of that idea, it's like, I like this idea, but wizards get better as, as the campaign continues. So thus these bad guys have to get better as well uh, to maintain a, an appropriate level of challenge. Um, and so that's, that's really what that book is about. It's about creating bad guys, which again is going to be an exercise and rolling on random tables because i love that um and then and then rules for how they develop kind of in the background while while um you know your wizards developing and that this also gave me an excuse to write something that people have called for since the very first days of, of Frostgrave, which is a scenario in which you attack another wizard's base um and so i wrote that in a couple of different ways um, so that it's a scenario where you can attack another wizard's base or your mortal enemy can, can find your base and attack you. Um, which then just became a beautiful excuse for talking about wizard bases and how you could model them on the table and, and cool defenses that you could buy for your wizard's base to, you know, 
to make it more defended when, when you do get attacked. And, you know, one thing led to another. And by the time I'm done, I've got a full, full supplement. <laughs> so that's, that's kind of how those things roll. And I think that's coming out in June, but I can't quite remember, but it's, it's sometime in the middle of the year. Um, I'm already thinking here, Thundercats, Warband, Mumra's Tomb. That's what exactly. I'm going to do with that. He's back! <laughs> <laughs> um, and then I've got a supplement coming out for Stargrave this year. I can't remember when again. And this one's kind of an oddity. Um, so this is this is Dead or Alive. And, and Dead or Alive... So when Frost, Stargrave first came out, I wrote a little supplement called Dead or Alive which was a solo bounty hunting supplement where you basically just rolled for this is who you're after. This is where you found them. These are the complications for getting them. You know, here's their gang. Um, and people seem to really enjoy that. Um, and I really enjoyed that. The, the only problem with it was there are only five five guys you could go after and five places you could catch them. And that, and that's just not enough. So, so I expanded it greatly. So there's now 20 different individuals you can go after and, and 20 different places you can find them and 20 different complications. And so you, you roll once on each of these tables and by the end of it, you've got, you know, 10,000 different permutations for a scenario. And each one of these people you're going after is really unique and, and has unique challenges for you know, the weapons they can use against you or the special powers and how long you've got to catch them before they just flee the board and what they're exactly trying to do while they're on the board. Um, so it's, it's really the closest I've come to writing a complete roll your own solo scenario. I mean, it, that's what it literally is. Roll your own solo scenario, uh, Stargrave. Uh, it's just focused on bounty hunting. So I think people will, Quite enjoy that. I certainly enjoyed writing it. Um, let's see. And then there's a big release coming in the next couple of months for Rangers of Shadow Deep, which is uh, both new and old. So I've got a book coming out with Modiphius called A Gathering of Heroes. And it does a couple of things. One, it collects... Uh, five of the supplements that I originally released uh, on drive through RPG, self-published through drive through RPG. Um, and then has what would be the equivalent of a very large supplement, um, which of course doesn't have a name because it's part of this book, but it's, it's where the name, book gets its title, a gathering of heroes. And, and this is an idea I had since the beginning of the game and knew I would work in at some point. But the idea is that, Finally, Alador is getting some help. Um, you know, they sent out, the king sent out his call for aid, you know, come help us fight the Shadow Deep. And, and no one, no nation has sent an army, but there's been this kind of slow trickle of heroes that have, that have come to fight. And so what I've got is 10 archetypes, uh, and each one of these represents kind of one type of these heroes. So there's an order called the Red Hawk Knights who have sent a few people to, to come and help fight. And so now when you make a character for Rangers Shadow Deep, you can still make a Ranger or you can make a Red Hawk Knight. And, and what that is, is kind of a, a package of skills and abilities and, and special stuff that kind of sits on top of the regular Rangers creation system. Um, so you, you know, basically you're giving up some of the uh, versatility that a ranger has when making a character for some special rules that are outside of, of that. So like the Red Hawk Knight are, the Red Hawk Knights are trained in, in fighting in plate mail and, or heavy armor at least, and thus don't suffer the movement penalty that everybody else in the game suffers but, you know, they don't have as many points, but they can't use bows. It's just forbidden by their order, so they have no missing weapons. Um, and so there's 10 different kind of types of heroes like that, and that also gave me a chance to kind of explore the wider world of Rangers of Shadowdeep 
but not in a coherent way, which is my favorite way of, of exploring worlds. So <laughs> you got these little snapshots of, you know, the Red Hot Knights come from here and then these guys come from over there. And so you learn a little bit about these other places and, and the people that come from there without getting kind of a map, uh, you know, or, a you know, learning about the geology of it all. Uh, you just learn what you need to know about these kind of specific heroes. Um, and as I was doing that, it also just got me thinking about, actually, I can really add another level to character creation in Rangers of Shadow Deep. So now you've got a big list of kind of, uh, they're called traits and limitations, uh, which Rangers can take, which can really be a lot of different things. So kind of special abilities that are, they're not heroic abilities because these are things that are always on for the Rangers. Um, and it's, it's hard to think of examples because, you know, it's hard when you're on the spot, but, but they can also take disadvantages as well. So like various, I don't know if they have a phobia of something of water that makes it harder for them to swim. Um, but then they get points that they can then spend on these traits that may allow them to, you know, use, a kind of weapon that all right one of them is the the oft called for a uh, two weapon fighter everybody wants apparently their rangers to fight with with two weapons but there wasn't a good way to balance that in the game as it stood but now through these traits you can take that trait and while you now get a bonus for using two weapons the trade off is you've had to spend some of your points creating the ranger to get that ability um and you know the same kind of things with magic and movement and stuff like that. So, so there's a huge new section in this book on on heroes and stuff. And then you've got uh, the first five supplements bound up together. And honestly, the reason I did this was because Modiphius did such a beautiful job with the rule book and, and making it into the kind of book that I'm just proud to to be the author of. That I wanted to to do that again, <laughs> and so, and and to give the players a chance to buy that really nice edition. Um, at the same time, very conscious of some people don't want to buy that material again. So when the book is released, uh, the ebook version of it is, I think, going to be fifteen pounds, which is basically what I would have priced the just the gathering of heroes, the kind of advanced character creation material with if it had appeared separately. So that there is a cheaper option if, if you just want the new material. Um, but I think from what I've seen, what Modivius have done before, the book's going to be gorgeous and you're, you're probably going to want that too. Um, and, and have a, a way that it can live on a night in a nice archive on your shelf. So, and beyond that, there's, there's probably other things coming, but I can't remember what they are at the moment. <laughs> Thanks very much for listening to this episode of the Tabletop Miniature Hobby Podcast. If you enjoy the show, then please do share it with someone else you think might enjoy it too. And be sure to check out our Discord community of like-minded hobbyists, which you could find at bedroombattlefields.com forward slash discord. It'd be great to see you in there.